started. Welcome to the next session of uh, the Book of Revelation. Today we're going to start really getting into uh, John's visions today, including the famous Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Um, <clears throat> today, the seven seals, that's the subject today. Basically, chapters four through seven, although the, as, in, in, as is, is the case in many parts of the Bible, Revelation is kind of oddly divided up into chapters. So to get to the seventh seal, we have to do at least one verse in chapter eight. Seventh, seventh seal is opened in the uh, first verse of chapter eight. Uh, we do have a little bit of old business to go over, uh, at least we'll, we'll see if anybody has thought about this from last week. You remember last week, we, uh, I ended with, um, but last week was the messages to the seven churches in Asia Minor, and I ended with a slide that asked, uh, what, what would Christ say to St. Andrew? It was a little optional bit of homework. Uh, what is St. Andrew, which church is St. Andrew like, or are we li a little bit like all of them? What are the challenges? What, are, what, would, what would Christ praise us for? What, what, are, what were reproaches would we get, and what promises would we get? Did anybody think about that and have any ideas? Uh, this was uh, one of the tasks of the Horizon team when they met was they had a little exercise in how to do this. Any thoughts? Yeah, probably nobody thought about that. Oh, well, Pat. I was on the Horizon team, so I can, I can speak to it a little bit. Uh, phrases that we came up with. Praise? Praise. Praise is one of them. Praises, yeah. Uh, that we came up with include our commitment to earth care. Commitment to earth care. And our commitment to education and worship. Commitment to education and worship, okay. Reproaches could be more active in outreach. And promises, uh, let's see, that's, we promise to, right? That's not... Promises, yes, uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. So we promise to keep going. We promise to keep going, all right. <laughs> okay, very good, all right. Anybody else think anything about this? Okay, that's fine. All right, chapter four. The, the have, Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, and you pointed this out in the case of the uh, uh, remarks to Pergamum. Pergamum, yes. And the uh, temple of Zeus or the devil or whatever. All the temples, yeah. All the temples and the reference to Satan in that letter or remark. Yes. Yeah. That is tempting us with idolatry. Yeah, we're we're always being tempted. Yeah. Yeah. And diversion. So yeah. I think Pat's point is well taken. Um, we live in that kind of gray middle ground of neither hot nor cold. A lot of the time, we struggle against those things. Yeah. Yeah. Just pure old idolatry. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're we're. We're living in the world, and that is a potential temptation for us. We, we, we can't opt out of that. 
we can't opt out of it. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Yeah, right, right. Okay. Anybody else have a, a thought? Okay, well, so um, we'll be, we're getting into uh, John's visions now. The heavenly journey begins. Um, so uh, John is going to uh, start having visions of scenes in heaven. The first six verses of chapter four. After this I looked and there in heaven a door stood open and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there in heaven stood a throne with one seated on the throne, and the one seated there looked, looks like jasper and carnelian, and around the throne is a rainbow that looks like an emerald. And around the throne there are 20, 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones are 24 elders dressed in white robes with golden crowns on their heads. Coming from the throne are flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And in front of the throne burned, burned seven flaming torches, which are the seven spirits of God. And in front of the throne there is something like a sea of glass, like crystal. Around the throne and on each side of the throne are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and back. So this is a scene of great majesty uh, symbolized by all of these brilliantly colored gemstones and precious metals. Number 24 is symbolic. Possibly the 12 tribes of Israel plus the 12 apostles, maybe. We can't be sure, but that that's a possibility. Everything here is, of course, highly symbolic. Sea of glass, like crystal. John may be borrowing from Ezekiel in, in, uh, in this passage. Over the heads of the living creatures. See, Ezekiel has living creatures, too. This is, Ezekiel has uh, several, has, has a, a sections in it that have apocalyptic language in it. Over the heads of the living creatures there was something like a dome shining like crystal spread out above their heads. The four living creatures in Revelation verses 6 through 8 Around the throne and on each side of the throne are four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with a face like a human, and the fourth living creature flying like, an e like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and inside. Day and night, without ceasing, they sing, Holy, 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 the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Full of eyes, symbolizing omniscience, omnis omniscience, seeing all. Lion, ox, human, and eagle, uh, also borrowed from Ezekiel. Now, one of the reasons, I, in, the first, in the first session of this series, I pointed out several reasons that Revelation is so difficult to understand, the symbolic language and, and so forth. Another reason it's, it's, it's hard to understand for us is that because there are so many references to the Hebrew Bible. That uh, may be one reason. One of the books I'm using to prepare these lessons is... Uh, the book entitled Revelations, plural, by Elaine Pagels from uh, Princeton, professor at Princeton. Um, she claims that uh, John and the people he uh, was writing to had a 
they were Christians with a, a Jewish background. They were, uh, had a Jewish background. Of course, they would have known the Hebrew Bible and recognized these references. As Christians today, we don't have a Hebrew background. And so I'm, I'm trying to point out uh, these references in Revelation to uh, the Hebrew Bible, what, what we call the Old Testament. Uh, I, I, I hope it helps rather than, than confuses. <laughs> So here uh, is a, another reference to Ezekiel, um, describing uh, beasts again. As for the appearance of their faces, the four had the face of a human being. Now in this case, uh, each beast had four faces on each side of their heads. As for the appearance of their faces, the four had the face of a human being, the face of a lion on the right side, the face of an ox on the left side, and the face of an eagle. <coughs> uh, these are, animals are sometimes used, these uh, uh, creatures are sometimes used to, uh, as symbols, symbolizing uh, our gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, occasionally. I think that go, goes back to a, a scholar called, um, Irenaeus in the first few centuries uh, CE. If I remember right, uh, Matthew is symbolized by a divine human, Mark by a winged lion, Luke by a winged ox, and John by a flying eagle, if I remember correctly. Borrowing from both Ezekiel and Revelation. Six wings. Now we're borrowing from Isaiah 6. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. There's words from our hymn and liturgy, right? Praising God, chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to the one who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall before the one who is seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the Lord, singing, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. The words holy, 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 and cast their crowns, you might recognize that from ELW number 165. Uh, verse 2, holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Right? Directly from Revelation. I'm, I, I'm going to try to identify, as we go along, I'll try to identify where we, we when, when we get words from our hymns from Revelation, there are almost every chapter in Revelation has words that have been extracted and used to make, uh, used in our hymns. The scroll with seven seals. Now we're moving on to chapter 5. Who is worthy to open the scroll? Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll written on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered 
so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Lion of Judah, that's a term from way back in Genesis 49. This is a chapter where Jacob is blessing each of his children. You remember one of his children was named Judah. So let's look at verses 9 and 10 from uh, Genesis 49. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He crouches down, he stretches out like a lion, like a lioness who dares rouse him up. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him and the obedience of the peoples is his. So that describes the lion of Judah. Uh, you remember who is descended from the tribe of Judah, David and therefore Jesus, right? The root of David, Isaiah 11, two verses. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Jesse was David's father, King David's father. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. Now we meet a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes. Who is worthy to open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, the Root of David. This sounds like a magnificent individual, right? Powerful, a king. Well, we get quite a surprise in the next verses. Then I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered. We have a bloody lamb now instead of a powerful ruler. This is a surprise. With seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth, he went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell before the lamb, each holding a harp and a golden bowl and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They sing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to break its seals, for you were slaughtered and by your blood you ransomed for God saints from every tribe and language and people and nations. You have made them a kingdom and priests serving our God, and they will reign on earth. Seven horns and seven eyes, symbols. Seven is the number of perfection, of course. You know, we've heard that before. Um, seven horns and seven eyes, perfect power and sight. A kingdom and priests serving our God borrowing from Exodus 19. Now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. Praise to the Lamb. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands singing with full voice, worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing, to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. That should sound familiar. ELW setting one.
Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God, power and riches and wisdom and strength, and honor and blessing and glory are his. Sing with all the people of God, and join in the hymn of all creation, blessing and honor, glory and might be to God and the Lamb forever. Amen. Wait, wait, wait for it, wait for it. <laughs> Handel's Messiah, the last chorus, number 53. Don't you remember I borrowed that score from you yesterday? <laughs> yes, from the Messiah. Now we get to the point in chapter six where we start opening the seals and with each seal that is opened, something dramatic happens. The first four seals correspond to the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The first seal is, is a, a, a rider on a white horse appears. <coughs> Then I saw the lamb break one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four creatures call out as with the voice of thunder, Come. I looked, and there was a white horse. Its rider had a bow. A crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. Most times in Revelation, white is the symbol of one who conquers. <coughs> This is a conquering power that none can resist. Second seal, the bright red horse. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature call out, come, and out came another horse, bright red. Its, right, its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people would slaughter one another and he was given a great sword. This uh, bright red horse symbolizes war and bloodshed, nullifying the Pax Romana. Pax Romana means the peace of Rome. This peace is ironic because Rome kept the peace through violence, through a threat of violence, uh, violently putting down any threat of revolution. This is Rome's armies being defeated so they can no longer keep the peace through threat of violence. So this uh, bright red horse symbolizes that bloodshed that it will defeat Rome. The third seal, the black horse. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature call out, come. I looked and there was a black horse. Its rider held a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a day's pay and three quarts of barley for a day's pay. <clears throat> but do not damage the olive oil and the wine. When there's war, what often follows is famine. The uh, sentence about a quart of wheat, those are exorbitant prices, which often have, happens in the midst of famine, price gouging. but do not damage the olive oil and the wine. So the famine is going to be limited. You see, barley and wheat you can plant every year. But olive trees and grapevines, boy, if those are damaged, it's going to be years before you can recover. So this is a symbolism that the famine will be limited in nature. The fourth seal, the pale green horse.
When he broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature call out, Come. I looked, and there was a pale green horse. Its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed with him. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, famine, and pestilence, and by the wild animals of the earth. So after conquering and bloodshed and famine, death. A fourth of the earth, well, it's not the whole earth. It's wide, but not total destruction. To kill with sword, famine, and pestilence. Let's again go back to the Old Testament and look at Ezekiel 6. Those far off shall die of pestilence. Those nearby shall fall by the sword. And any who are left and are spared shall die of famine. Thus I will spend my fury upon them. By wild animals of the earth, again, Ezekiel, this time in chapter 5. I will send famine and wild animals against you, and they will rob you of your children. Pestilence and bloodshed shall pass through you, and I will bring the sword upon you. I, the Lord, have spoken. The fifth seal. How long, Lord? Now we're done with horses. When he broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slaughtered for the word of God and for the testimony they had given. They cried out with a loud voice, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long will it be before you judge and avenge our blood on the inhabitants of the earth? They were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number would be complete, both of their fellow servants and of their brothers and sisters who were soon to be killed as they themselves had been killed. These are a cry from the martyrs for uh, vindication. We might check out Psalm part of Psalm 79 for a similar point of view. How long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealous wrath burn like fire? Pour out your anger on the nations that do not know you and on the kingdoms that do not call on your name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his habitation. Do not remember against us the iniquities of our ancestors. Let your compassion come speedily to meet us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O God, of our salvation, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Let the avenging of the outpoured blood of your servants be known among the nations before our eyes. White robes, again, white is the symbol of uh, conquering or uh, victory. I have another reference to a hymn. I just thought of it this morning, so I didn't get a chance to put it on the slide. I'll just read it. This is uh, ELW 654, The Church's One Foundation, uh, verse 3. Uh, Though with a scornful wonder this world sees her oppressed by schis schisms rent asunder, by her heresies distressed. Yet saints their watch are keeping, their cry goes up how long, and soon the night of weeping shall be the morn of song. The sixth seal, a great earthquake. When he broke the sixth seal, I looked and there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, 
and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree drops its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll rolling itself up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the magnates and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? <coughs> Excuse me. Sun became black and moon like blood. You may recognize that from the prophet Joel, or from Peter's speech on Pentecost Day. Blood and fire and smoky mist. You remember that from Peter's uh, speech? From Joel, I will show, show portents in the heavens and on earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. The sky vanished like a scroll rolling itself up. Here, John is borrowing from Isaiah 34. All the host of heaven shall rot away, and the skies roll up like a scroll. All their host shall wither like a leaf withering on a vine, or fruit withering on a fig tree. Fall on us and hide us. This is from uh, the prophet Hosea, chapter 10. Hosea was a prophet that, is, that, um, that uh, uh, preached to the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, this was after the split. The United Kingdom of Israel, after the reign of Solomon, was uh, split apart into the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom, uh, still called Israel. And uh, uh, Amos and Hosea were prophets that uh, preached to the northern kingdom of Israel before it was wiped out by the, uh, um, the empire of, of Assyria. Um, uh, Hosea was preaching against uh, the northern kingdom uh, because they had fallen away uh, from following God and were worshiping pagan gods. Um, before, earlier in the book of Hosea, uh, he, um, he preached against their worship of uh, idols. One of the worship places in the north was, um, uh, we, we usually pronounce it Bethel, it was Bethel, which means house of God or place of God. He uses a pejorative term earlier in the book, uh, uh, Beth Avon, which means place of worthlessness which is where this uh, uh, name Avon comes from. Uh, high, the high places of Avon, he says, this is where the worship of pagan gods took place. So he preaches against it here, these places. The high places of Avon, the sin of Israel shall be destroyed. Thorn and thistle shall grow up on their altars. They shall say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. They're trying to escape the destruction that Hosea is saying surely will happen to them for their uh, disobedience. And, was, and uh, John is borrowing those words from Hosea. Great day of their wrath, who is able to stand? Back to Joel chapter 2. The Lord utters his voice at the head of his army. How vast is his host. Numberless are those who obey his command. Truly the day of the Lord is great, terrible indeed. Who can endure it? Chapter 7 is, oh, uh, yes, yeah. The Arya? But who may abide the day of his coming? I think that's the focus of the chapter. 
It sounds like it. That's from the Messiah? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I should have brought Pat's book along today. We could have looked it up. Yeah, I didn't bring it. All right, yeah, thanks. So now chapter 7, yeah, I mean, six seals have been opened. We have one more to go. But suddenly chapter 7 is, we, is an interlude. We, uh, we, t- we have a break from opening the seals. Uh, chapter 7 is a promise to the faithful. Um, first, a divine protection during the tribulation to come. One hundred and forty-four thousand of Israel are sealed. Uh, you may have heard this number before, right? Well, we'll talk about it in a little uh, in a little bit. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind could blow on earth or sea or against any tree. I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. He called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to damage earth and sea, saying, do not damage the earth or the sea or the trees until we have marked the servants of our God with the seal on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed out of every tribe of the people of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of, well, you know how this is going going to go, right? Yeah, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. I won't read it, all of those words, but, you know, it goes on like that. Four winds. These are uh, the destructive forces, obviously. Well, let's take a look at Jeremiah chapter 49. And I will bring upon Elam the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and I will scatter them to all these winds, and there shall be no nation to which the exiles from Elam shall not come. What's Elam? Here's Elam. It's uh, southeast of Assyria and Babylonia, uh, northwest of Persia, next to the Persian Gulf. Capital was Susa, city of Susa. Just a little geographic uh, orientation. Sealed means protected. They're these. uh, 144,000 apparently are going to be protected. Now, this is a symbolic number, right? And it, it, we, can, we can discuss what this means in various discussions. Is, is this, uh, does this mean a faithful remnant of Israel? Could be. Could this be those who survive the tribulations that are described in Revelation? Could this be... I mean, there have been any number of uh, speculations about what this is. Now, some Protestant denominations in the past have taken this literally. There will be 144,000 Christians who will be saved. Apparently, that's the apparently that's the size of heaven, according to these. You know, that's how many we will fit. <coughs> apparently, I'm thinking of one particular denomination that. Had to, had, had to revise their doctrine because after all this time, certainly there must have been 144,000 uh, uh, righteous people and heaven is already full. And so may, may, maybe God's going to make room on a, on a, on a, on a, on a uh, reconstructed earth for even more. I don't know. Uh, uh, lots of speculation on what this means, but it, 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 it's likely that this was it, it, purely a symbolic number of uh, people who are sealed. Um, there are tribes of Israel that are mentioned in here. 
the list is prob problematic. I mean, just to underscore uh, the fact that this is symbolic, the, the list of tribes is symbolic. It says, the, there's a verse that says, every tribe of Israel. But the tribes of Dan and Ephraim are not mentioned in the list. Also, it mentions a tribe of Joseph, and there was no tribe of Joseph. So it, just to underscore the fact that, you know, we can't take this literally. If you do, we've got a problem. Um, Let's go back to Genesis 49. This is, uh, I, I took a verse from this earlier about the Lion of uh, Judah. And this is the, the chapter where Jacob blesses his sons, his, Jacob's last words to his son. So it, it goes through all of Jacob's sons, which is where the tribes, names of the tribes of Israel come from. Uh, I'm going to run out of time if I read this whole thing, so I won't. Um, there's Reuben, Simeon, and Levi right? Judah, long bit about Judah, Zebulun, Issachar, Dan, uh, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, there's Joseph. Now, Joseph wasn't a, didn't, it wasn't a tribe. Why? Well, it's, see, Joseph was, in, uh, was the first to go to Egypt, and he made a name for himself there. There wasn't a tribe called Joseph, but two of Joseph's sons, uh, uh, Jacob's grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh, became founders of tribes. So there were the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim. Now, uh, Ephraim wasn't mentioned in the list in, in Revelation. Okay. And then the, the rest of the tribes are um, Benjamin, of course, the, the um, one of the two sons of Rachel, uh, Jacob's favorite wife. The other one was Joseph. So uh, my point is, I let you know we can't take this literally, or uh, there would be a problem with this list. Now uh, the last half of chapter seven is assurance of all, uh, ultimate salvation, and it goes like this. After this I looked and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out, cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these robed in white and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one who knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. The one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Um, <clears throat> notice there's a, a little twist here. The lamb will be their shepherd. Lamb becomes the shepherd. <laughs> Multitude, no one could count. Compare that with the 144,000. That's countable, but here we have a multitude that's not countable. Interesting, huh? Who are these robed in white? Another hymn. This one's from the LBW, Lutheran Book of Worship. That's the green hymnal that we used to use before the Cranberry hymnal. Uh, 
I didn't print off the whole page, but uh, um, who is this host arrayed in white like thousand snow-clad mountains bright? Springs of the water of life. Now, is, we're, we, this is a forward reference to the end of Revelation. We're getting a, John should have written, spoiler alert, right? Because we're, we're getting a peek at how it's going to come out in the end. Uh, maybe he's afraid he's going to lose his readers to all the gloom and doom so far. So he's, he's giving us a peek at the end. Chapters... Uh, 21 and 22, the last two chapters of the book. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. And then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let everyone who hears say, come, let everyone who is thirsty come, let anyone who wishes to take the water of life as a gift. Wipe away every tear. Again, chapter 21. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. We could also take a look at Isaiah 25 for a similar thought. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. Finally, chapter 8, the seventh seal is opened. We've had so much drama. What is the seventh seal going to bring? Another surprise. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Wow. What a surprise. Just silence. An awesome and reverent silence about what the Lord has done. This is often a response to divine judgment. Uh, take a look at Zechariah. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. Return to Primeval Silence. This is from a book called Second Esdras. This is from the Apocrypha. It's not in, the, it's not in our Bible. Then the world shall be turned back to primeval silence for seven days, as it was at the first beginnings, so that no one shall be left. And there's the scroll with the seven seals. That's the end of my material for today. Uh, Larry. <laughs> yeah, I should bring my microphone back there so you can, people can hear you. The symbol of the lion is also the symbol of Venice. And on the Adriatic coast in Croatia, which was under Venice for a long time, you see the symbol, that symbol on buildings and walls all over the place. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? I should, should have asked uh, this before. Yes. Uh, Steve, you've done a nice job of a we in the business called intertextuality, one text used in another, and uh, Revelation itself using these 
Old Testament texts and a few others, and how then it becomes a text used in hymns and sacred music. The question that always um, perplexes me or interests me, maybe that's another way of putting it, is how does that intertextuality continue into our own day? Um, we sing the hymns, but probably most of us uh, don't think about the intertextuality of Revelation so much. We just sing the hymns or we listen to the Messiah and so on and so forth. But behind all of this sequence of intertextuality seems to be a great angst about the world and where things are going and so on and so forth. Okay, we sit here, some of us, most of us in this room probably sit here. We've got enough to eat. Things are perking along reasonably well here. Um, how does this speak to us today if we are not in the midst of this anxiety and trauma? We can look at some people in our own country right now who are not happy with the way the world is going. You can speak of Christian nationalists, you can speak of other groups, they're highly apocalyptic. Um, I'm not sure their view of the world resonates with my view of the world, and I'm not quite sure often how revelation <laughs> intersects with my view of the world. I'm pretty comfortable, thank you. Um, so it's more of a rhetorical question yeah. or a question or a set of questions to think about. And you've done a nice job of showing how revelation is not just a code. And if we can break the code, then we understand it. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Well, thank you, yeah. Um, yeah, sometimes, there are, there, sometimes there's no easy answers for these things. It, um, it isn't just a code. Like I, I mentioned, the, the list of, uh, of tribes. <laughs> well, we can't, all I can say is we can't take it literally because there would be a big problem because it's not right, <laughs> right? Uh, I liked your comment about, uh, for instance, uh, Christian nationalism and so forth, and uh, some of the angst that in the world. I believe the last class in this series, <coughs> which I, in which I want to talk about um, reading Revelation today, I believe that happens to fall on Christ the King Sunday. And I'm really glad it does, because that would be a great time well, one of the themes of Revelation is human empires always perish. You know, the Roman Empire did. Well, going all the way back to the Assyrian Empire that conquered northern Israel and the Babylonian Empire and the Persian Empire and the, uh, Alexander the Great's Empire and the, you know, all. And today we have uh, those who support the empires of today, the secular nationalists and the, and, the, and the Christian nationalists, and Christ the King Sunday was established by Pope Pius uh, XI, do I have that right? Um, during the reign of Benito Mussolini in Italy in 1925, uh, because he was, uh, uh, that was during the, uh, the secular nationalist movement during M Mussolini's rule in, in Italy. And the Pope uh, established Christ the King Sunday to counter that uh, nationalism that was so rampant, rampant in Italy because the only kingdom that will survive forever is the kingdom of God, right? 
So I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to talking during On Christ the King Sunday about that, the last two chapters in Revelation. Um, now I'm getting way off the track here. <laughs> and it's time to quit anyway. So uh, thanks for coming. See you next week.